in this video i am going to discuss a very important topic that's diabetes mellitus so let's start diabetes mellitus so before understanding the diabetes it's important to understand the anatomy physiology of the pancreas and pancreatic hormones right so what is pancreas pancreas is a intra abdominal organ although anatomically it's a single organ but histopathologically it is a double organ what is a double organ it is having two parts the exocrine and the endocrine in the exocrine part it secretes enzyme but from the endocrine part it secretes hormone currently for teaching you the diabetes i am interested in the endocrine part the part which secretes the hormone so see this is the histology of the pancreas so i have shown you pancreas which is a intra abdominal organ here is the pancreas can you see this is the pancreas you can see the histology of the pancreas now here you can see these are uh, these are the ducts can you see these all are the ducts uh, that is the exocrine part and that secretes the enzymes which are required for digestion currently i am not interested in that so that is the exocrine part which secrete enzymes for digestion in the form of the ducts but currently i am interested in the endocrine part the endocrine part is actually a collection of cell can you see this is collection of cell the collection of the cell is known as islet of langerhans it is known as islet of langerhans and it secretes hormones this is the endocrine part it secretes hormones right so how many type of cells are there there are basically four major cells the alpha cell beta cell delta cell and pp pancreatic polypeptide cell now the alpha cell secrete glucagon the beta cell secrete insulin the delta cell secrete somatostatin and the pp pancreatic polypeptide cell secrete pancreatic polypeptide so please learn the four type of cells present here you can see these one are alpha some are beta so they all are secreting their respective hormones you got my point let's start the disease diabetes mellitus what is diabetes mellitus can you tell me what is diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic disorders sharing a common feature of hyperglycemia so in diabetes there is hyperglycemia that is what do you mean by hyperglycemia hyper means more glycemia means glucose so there is increased glucose concentration increased glucose level in the blood that is known as diabetes now the point is that why there is increased glucose for understanding that you must understand the metabolism of the glucose right now you can see it is a simplified sketch diagram i have drawn for you this is the blood vessel and this is the cell the cell three type of the cells i am talking about the liver cell the skeletal muscle cell and adipose tissue cell these are the target organs inside which the glucose is stored so liver skeletal muscle and adipose tissue right this is a cell now the two hormones i taught you you can see the insulin and see the arrow insulin takes the glucose from the blood to the cell and store the glucose in the cell in the form of the glycogen so insulin decreases blood glucose level it is taking glucose away from the blood right on the contrary the other hormone the glucagon it degrade the glycogen and convert into glucose and take the glucose from the cell to the blood so it increases the blood glucose level you got my point now insulin is secreted by alpha cells of the islet of langerhans of pancreas and glucagon is secreted by beta cells of the pancreas so in human body we have in our pancreas we all have alpha as well as beta both cells the normal individual have both cells so whenever we require insulin we can secrete insulin and decrease the blood glucose level and whenever we require to increase blood glucose level we secrete glucagon and increase the blood glucose level for example at the time of meal when we take meal the blood glucose is more so we secrete insulin to decrease it right and at the time of the fasting the blood glucose is less we are not eating anything we want to increase the blood glucose level so we secrete glucagon so at the time of meal the insulin is secreted at the time of the fasting glucagon is secreted and this is homeostasis everything is balanced right so this is normal but what is the problem in the patient with diabetes diabetes is a disorder in which insulin there is some problem with insulin either insulin is absent number 1 the beta cells are destroyed and there is no insulin number 1 or it is present but it is not functional so there the defect can be qualitative or it can be quantitative if the defect is quantitative insulin is absent and if the defect is qualitative i mean it's present but it's non functional so if insulin is not working what will happen the blood glucose will not shift to the cell so there will be two problems the blood glucose level will rise and the cell glucose level will fall both will happen the blood glucose level will rise and the cell glucose level will fall you got my point the blood glucose level which is rise it will go to many organs especially three organs 
the kidney causing diabetic nephropathy to the retina causing diabetic retinopathy and to the nerves the various peripheral nerves causing diabetic neuropathy so the increased blood glucose level causes damage to three organs that is the long term complication of the diabetes right and decrease glucose level in the cell causing starvation of the cell the cell is starving you know the cell doesn't doesn't get the energy right so patient feel like weight loss and there is starvation so the point is that this cell cannot utilize the glucose from the blood although having abundant of glucose at the doorstep but the cell cannot utilize so that is a problem with the diabetes in diabetes the patient cannot move the glucose from blood to cell because there is a problem with the insulin either it's absent or non functional it leads to hyperglycemia in the blood and decrease glucose in the cell hyperglycemia cause multiple organ damage and decrease glucose in the cell means cells are starving for the energy despite having glucose right on the doorstep so that is the thing now coming on the classification of the diabetes there are two type of diabetes type 1 and type 2 type 1 is only 10% type 2 is 90% type 1 is known as juvenile onset diabetes because most commonly it is diagnosed in adolescent age it is also known as insulin dependent diabetes mellitus that is iddm because here the only treatment is insulin replacement that's it so these are the two names given to type 1 type 2 is maturity onset it is usually diagnosed after 40 to 50 years it usually occurs after 40 to 50 years of age that's why maturity onset and it is also known as non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus that is niddm right not some misnomer it is not the thing that insulin is not required for type 2 in type 2 first we try with dietary modification lifestyle changes oral hypoglycemic agents if nothing works the in the end we will move to the insulin here the first treatment is insulin here the last treatment is insulin that's why type 1 is known as insulin dependent and type 2 is known as non insulin dependent i hope you got it so before studying the pathogenesis of type 1 and type 2 diabetes it's important to study the insulin regulation it's important to study the insulin regulation so there are three things insulin synthesis release and its action can you see this diagram can you all see this diagram a simplified diagram this is the diagram of a normal human being imagine the person is taking the meal this is the meal when the person take the meal orally the uh, glucose is going in the mouth in the esophagus in the stomach in the intestine it get absorbed it get absorbed and reaches in the lumen of the blood right now ultimately the blood is having the glucose abundant of glucose now whenever glucose is more than 70 70 mg per deciliter in the blood it will move to the pancreas it will go to the pancreas it will go to beta cell of the pancreas can you see this cell this cell is the beta cell inside the pancreas this is pancreas inside the pancreas the beta cell so glucose is going here glucose from the blood is going to the pancreas stimulating the pancreas to secrete the insulin in the blood so on stimulation the pancreas is secreting the insulin in the blood can you see the blue color is the insulin initially only red dots were there that is glucose the red glucose is going to the pancreas taking insulin out now this insulin will go to three organs can you see the three organs this is liver this is skeletal muscle and this is adipose tissue i guess you can see the three organs are in front of you so insulin is going to these three organs these three organs have receptor for the insulin known as insulin receptor so insulin will act on its receptor and causes the implantation of glut4 can you see here i have written glut4 causes the implantation of glut4 on these cells glut4 is the door for the glucose you know so if glucose want to enter into these three cells directly it cannot enter without insulin so first insulin is the glucose is going to the pancreas taking insulin out and asking the insulin please help me i want to go inside these three organs and get stored so insulin is going and creating the door for the glucose so you can see insulin is the key for the lock if glucose is directly going into these three organs for storage there is a lock it cannot be opened so it is going to the pancreas taking insulin out and asking the insulin please help me can you open the lock for me so insulin is going to these three organs and opening the lock for the glucose so that glucose can enter through glut4 inside these three target organs and get stored there so this is the story you got my point now you tell me okay i will explain you so you can see here inside the liver the glucose will be stored as glycogen skeletal muscle also it will be stored as glycogen and adipose tissue it will be stored as fatty acid you know so this is how glucose is stored let me teach you the pathogenesis of type 1 and type 2 diabetes one by one let's talk about type 1 diabetes 
The problem is that the body cannot synthesize insulin. Insulin is absent. Which cells synthesize insulin? In pancreas, in islet of Langer hands of pancreas, there are four type of cells. Beta cells synthesize insulin. Beta cells are destroyed. Who is destroying the beta cell? The body's own immunity. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder in which body's own immune cells, that is cytotoxic T cells, CD4 cytotoxic T cells, they are destroying the own beta cells. So they are causing the self-destruction of the beta cell. So beta cell will become zero. So insulin will become zero. So that is the pathogenesis. In type 1 diabetes, there is loss of self-tolerance. Because of the loss of self-tolerance, the self-reactive T lymphocyte killed. They kill the, they cause degradation, the beta cells of the pancreas. They attack the beta cells of the pancreas. So beta cell will be absent. Insulin will be absent since there is no insulin. Now the glucose coming in the blood. This is the glucose. Patient is eating. So glucose is coming after absorption in the blood. Glucose tried to go in these three organs directly. It cannot go. So it is going to the pancreas to secrete insulin. But insulin cannot secrete it because beta cells are absent. So no insulin will come. So glucose will not enter and glucose will remain in blood only. Causing hyperglycemia. I hope you got the pathogenesis. Coming on pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Right. In type 2 diabetes, what is the problem here? Insulin is an adequate amount. The beta cells are normal, you know, the pancreas is normal, the beta cells are normal and insulin is secreted in adequate amount in blood. You will say, ma'am, then what is the problem? The insulin is going to these three organs, binding on its receptor, the insulin receptor, but it cannot do the function. So the receptors are defective. You know, insulin cannot show its function. The insulin is functionally incapable. So it cannot implant GLUT4 and the do it cannot open the door for the glucose. So, you know, its presence is good for nothing. It is present although, but it is non-functional, right? So here the problem in, in the three target organ. In type 1, the problem was in pancreas, the beta cell of the pancreas. But in type 2, the problem is in these three target organs, that is liver, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. You got my point? So, whenever the person is eating, the glucose is going inside. Glucose is going to the pancreas, so insulin is secreted, but that insulin is non-functional. Insulin is going to these three target organs, trying to open the door that is implanting GLUT4 for the glucose, but it is unable to do so. This is known as insulin resistance. So basically in type 2 diabetes, we are having insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? It is failure of the target organ to respond to insulin. The three target organs, liver, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, there is failure. They are not responding to insulin. Now, what are the clinical features of diabetes, type 1 or type 2? So, there is a typical triad, triple P. Patient eat more, that is polyphagia. Patient drink more, that is polydipsia. And patient urinate more, that is polyuria. All three are shown in this figure. Can you see a lady? Can you see a patient, a lady? She is eating more, she is drinking more, and she is using the restroom, that is urinating more. So, triple P, polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. So the triple P is the triad. You got my point. But along with the triple P, the triple P that is the triad. The fourth thing is the weight loss. Although patient eat more, still weight loss. The two things are paradox. Still they happen together in diabetes. The patient eat more, still the patient have weight loss. So weight loss is there. It is not included in triad, but it it also there. Right. So why it is happening? Can you tell me the reason for the for the symptoms? Can you tell me the reasons now? As I have told you, whatever uh, glucose is present in the blood, it cannot go and get stored in the target organ. So whatever glucose present in blood, it will go in the urine. Glycosuria, it will go in the urine. Uh, glucose is an osmotic molecule. It will not go alone. It will drag water with it. Right? So it will result in polyuria. Because of the polyuria, there is dehydration in the patient. Volume depletion and dehydration. And that will stimulate the thirst center causing poly. Dipsia. So polyuria leads to polydipsia. It's not polydipsia used to give rise to polyuria. So patient urinate more, that's why patient drink more. So the two things are related, right? And regarding polyphagia, because uh, there is weight loss, there is negative energy balance. So patient have increased appetite and uh, polyphagia, right? You got my point. Now we have seen the two type of the diabetes, we have seen the differences between them. I request you to read this table, you will be able to understand it. The type 1 and type 2 diabetes. What are the complications of the diabetes? In the complication, the two, two complications are important. Diabetes ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar coma. So these are the two things. What is diabetic ketoacidosis? 
so whenever there is insulin deficiency in type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes whenever there is insulin deficiency in type 1 it is completely absent now it stimulate an enzyme known as lipo protein lipase this causes the uh, causes the breakdown of the adipose tissue and it convert into free fatty acid the free fatty acid uh, oxidized and form the ketone bodies the ketone bodies first come in the blood and then they go to the urine so there is ketonemia and ketonuria in type 1 diabetes right how you will diagnose a case of diabetes lastly how you will diagnose a case we have seen the pathogenesis the clinical features the complications now it's time to diagnose diabetes how you will diagnose diabetes there are three three ways urine test blood test others in the urine you will test for glucose and ketone for glucose there is benedict test i guess everyone knows what is benedict test the principle of the benedict reagent the benedict test you know the color changes right so the benedict with the help of the benedict test we can detect the glucose in urine and for ketone we have rothera test i guess everyone knows what is rothera test right so with the help of rothera test we detect the ketone in the urine so benedict and rothera is done to detect the glucose and ketone in the urine let's talk about blood test in the blood test what is the cutoff how much glucose should be present in the blood to diagnose a case of diabetes do you know the answer do you know the answer so there are revised criteria for diagnosis of diabetes as per ada american diabetes association the american diabetes association have given three criteria what are the three criteria here the random glucose the fasting glucose and two r postprandial glucose after a 75 mg oral glucose load so random is not related to any meal so any time if you take the uh, glucose level in blood if it is more than 200 so the cut off here is the 200 fasting means patient should not have eaten anything for the last 8 hours after that the sample you are taking and checking the blood glucose level it is known as fasting the fasting below 100 is normal 100 to 125 is impaired fasting glucose test and more than 126 is diagnostic of diabetes more than 126 you got my point now coming on the 2r the 2r after 75 milligram glucose load um, here less than 140 is normal 140 to 199 it's impaired and more than 200 is diagnostic so you have to learn the three values for random only one value is 200 for fasting more than 126 and for postprandial more than 200 so 200 126 200 if it is there all three are fitting it is a diagnosed case it is a short short case of diabetes it is diagnosed right now in others there is a test known as glycosylated hemoglobin what do you mean by glycosylated hemoglobin whenever the glucose is more in the blood it forms glycosylated bonds with the proteins present in the blood now hemoglobin is one of the protein now so the sugar will form a glycosylated bond with this uh, hemoglobin and the product formed is known as glycosylated hemoglobin you got my point so the increased blood glucose level uh, form a glycosylated bond a bond with the hemoglobin known as glycosylated hemoglobin now the life life uh, span of rbc is uh, is 120 days so this glycosylated hemoglobin also remain for 120 days 120 days means nearly four months so it will give you an average sugar of the last three four months of last 90 to 120 days so that is its relevance its its relevance so that's all about diabetes we have seen its clinical features its pathogenesis its types its complications its diagnosis i hope you will be able to solve any question based on it thank you